and good morning to our international audience. I'm going to talk to you today about some things that point to the last days. And I think you'll find it very interesting because people debate over whether or not we really are in the last days. There's a scripture in, in uh, one of Peter's epistles that says people in the last days will be mocking and saying, where's the, uh, uh, where's the promise of his coming? Nothing's changed. Everything's the same since the creation. Nothing has really changed. So what makes you think we're in the last days? Well, today I'm not going to just come out and tell you dogmatically that we are because none of us know when Christ is going to return, but we're going to look at some statistics today that might make you wonder if we are in the last days. Let's ask God's blessing and we'll get started. Father, we thank you now for each one who's, who's here today and watching over the internet. We ask your blessing and your, your anointing on the teaching and on the hearing and help us to really appreciate uh, what your scriptures teach and how that we can be encouraged that Jesus may come back even in our generation. In his name we pray, amen. In Matthew 24, and I'm going to turn over there and just read a very little bit to you today because this is such a familiar passage. We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it today. But we're going to look at certain things. Matthew 24, Jesus was asked in verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The King James says the end of the world. The world is never coming to an end. And the word here is not cosmos, which, we, which would refer to the planet. The, the world is not going to blow up. But he said the end of the age. The Greek word there is aeon. And so Jesus tells us here that he said, uh, first of all, take heed that no man deceive you. There's going to be false prophets. Uh, verses four, five, and six. You're gonna, you're gonna. There's gonna be false prophets, and then you're gonna hear about wars and rumors of more wars. You're gonna hear all these things, but the end is not yet, because these things are going to happen. They're going to be, verse seven, nations rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And you've kept up with what's going on in the news with the um, <clears throat> real threat of North Korea that might attack the United States someday. They've already threatened to attack us, and for what reason? Uh, ostensibly because of American sanctions, but we wouldn't have to do that if they'd behave themselves, uh, to use a Trumpism, if they would just behave themselves. That fellow whose name I can't pronounce, Kim Young un or something. Kim Jong un Kim Jong un With a name like that, why come his mother didn't just call him Tommy and we would have it? Because his father's name was Kim Jong Il. Il. Ooh. Well, they have a sister probably named Kim Jong un But anyway... <laughs> That guy, who is a little pot-bellied, little, little fat fella, who is, uh, who is eating very well while the people in North Korea are starving, and they're going malnourished, and they're sick, and they don't have proper nutrition, and yet he's eating very well. He's doing very fine. Um, he's making all these threats, and now even China is coming over to our side to, uh, to ally themselves with us in, their, in our sanctions against North Korea. But, but you know, wars and rumors of wars. I remember as a kid, you know, hearing about the Vietnam War, and they told us then that this war would probably last so long that even 10-year-olds would probably have to go to war and fight. And I thought, that's incredible. And we were in 12 years in Vietnam, two years in what is called police action by Harry Truman, and then 10 years of solid combat, and actual, actual war, 10 years of actual combat where, according to statistics, we lost, and it's not exactly accurate, I don't think, but somewhere between 55 to 58 thousand soldiers and for what that many young men were killed and for what what did we gain from being in in a whole decade of 10 solid years in combat in vietnam now robert s mcnamara admitted later on many years later that america's policy was wrong about the vietnam war he admitted that the domino theory was totally wrong because what they believed at that time was that communism was going to take over South Korea and it would come all the way down <clears throat> and then, then take over eventually Australia and New Zealand. And the idea was it was going to be taken over the entire world. But, they, but Robert S. McNamara, who was the defense uh, secretary, I think, under Johnson, later on admitted that that was totally wrong. All North Vietnam wanted to do was reunite South Vietnam so they could have one Vietnam, not a North Vietnam or a South Vietnam, just one Vietnam. And he admitted, uh, Robert McNamara admitted that 
we were keeping them from doing that. And so what happened? And I predicted this would happen when all the Paris peace talks were going on with all the crazy uh, discussions about the shape of the table in Paris, France, because they wanted to have these discussions about peace. And I predicted then, I said, here's what's going to happen. They've got these secret talks, and Richard Nixon is going to say, look, guys, we've been trying to get out of this war for years. If you'll just back off and stop shooting at us, we will let you have South Vietnam, and we'll just tell America that the war is over and we'll bring them all home. Well, I remember the speech he gave one night. It seems like it was in February, but I'm not sure. Richard Nixon announced to the American people, the war in Vietnam is over. And so we're going to pull everybody out. We didn't even leave a soldier behind to even make sure it stayed over. And so North Vietnam was told, if you'll just stop shooting us, we'll leave. And then you just walk in and take it. And that's exactly what happened. So what in the world were we doing? Well, now we've been in Afghanistan, which is the longest war in the United States history, for something like 16 years. And what are we getting out of that? Well, supposedly we're fighting terrorism, so it doesn't come over here, but it's already over here. I don't know exactly what's going on. But are we in the last days? Now, Jesus said these things would happen. I want to give you the title of our message today is Statistics for the Last Days. And I want to give you some, some statistics about things that are happening today. You know, <clears throat> we think that people have been liberated today and the teenagers are more mature than they ever have been before and they need to have all these freedoms and so on. In Colorado, they now have freedom to smoke marijuana if they want to. So you would think that teenagers would be the happiest that they've ever been in American history. Now, the statistics from 2010 to 2015, I don't have them for the last two years, but from, from 2010 to 2015, listen to these statistics. Suicide among teenagers has increased, not decreased with all the video games that they have that I never heard of a video game when I was a teenager. With all the things they have, you'd think that they'd be very, very happy. They'd be supremely happy. But, but just in that five-year period, suicide among teenage boys increased by 30%. Now they got all the they got sexual freedom. They can kill their babies if they actually if somebody is impregnated outside of wedlock. They use birth control. They got all this stuff. They can have all the fun. They watch these crazy TV shows that encourage them to go out and have sex before marriage, like Two and a Half Men. I've never watched that show, but I've seen a minute here or thirty seconds there, and that's enough to make me sick. So they think they can just do anything they want to do, and they ought to be happy. But yet there was a thirty percent increase in suicide among teenage boys in that five-year period, and a 40% increase in, in suicide among girls. 40% increase among girls in suicide. Now, they didn't give an explanation for this. Some mental health experts blame social media. There are also over one million teens who are runaways. Every year, one million teens in the United States run away from home. They're, they're not as happy as I was when I was 13. In 1970, before abortion became legal, statistically, and they could do anonymous surveys and get this accurate, 28% of high school girls surveyed were sexually active. And then, of course, in 1973, they made abortion legal. So now, in case you are sexually active, we can take away the consequences. By 1991, 21 years later, it had grown. Sexually active girls admitted it had grown to over 50%. So the ones who admitted it was 28% in 1970, 21 years later, it was over 50%, and that was over 20 years ago. I don't know what it is today. It's way up there. I'd like to know if anybody hears, reads that on the Internet, because I've got a number of these statistics that I'm going to read to you today off the Internet. And so if you dig up anything that's more recent, please share it with me. I'd appreciate it. Women's rights are not so much about pro-abortion as it is to make abortion legal so as not to infringe on the rights of women to have sexual freedom without any repercussions. Now in verse 7 in Matthew 24, Jesus also said there will be famines. Now Americans will say, you know, maybe we're not in the last days because after all, we just had Thanksgiving. I mean, we ate pretty much to the full, didn't we? I mean, we had a... We, we got plenty of food, so we're not in the last days. There's no famines. Jesus said there's going to be famines. We're doing very well, but that's just in the United States. That's right. Over 200,000 people are in the world now starve to death every single day. 
200,000 per day. What's that per week? 14, one, oh, 1. 1.4 million? 200,000 a day. Yeah, 200,000 a day times seven. Was that 1.4 million? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a week. Die from starvation. And you tell me we're not blessed today because you had a nice Thanksgiving turkey. And you think, well, everything's great, everything's fine. Or, is that correct? Uh, just because America is well fed doesn't mean we're not in the last days. A few days ago, I, I heard that the United States and Britain, I heard this, I don't know if I was listening to the TV set, I think, it was, I, think I was listening to the television set, and um, I heard that America represents 6% of the world's population, but we have over 90% of the world's wealth. But look at the rest of the world, 94% of the world is living in poverty compared to us. Jesus said here in verse 7, he said, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Hmm, pestilences. Well, I've now heard that they're thinking the bubonic plague might come back. One of the biggest and horrible, most horrible diseases is the Ebola virus. I think that's what they call it. It's, it is so bad that it's very, very contagious. And it, it came in Africa, and I forget how it got started. Anyway, some scientists went over there some years ago and got some of this Ebola virus and brought it to the United States, which I thought that's crazy. Uh, because if it, if it gets out, it could kill, you know, many, many thousands of people. <coughs> well, <clears throat> they uh, brought it to Reston, Virginia. Reston, Weston, however you say it. Anyway, I used to live in that area. It's the most dangerous disease known in the world, and they brought it here for study, and they had a laboratory there. I stood on that very spot where that laboratory existed. It's now been torn down, and now, you know what? is built there on the very grounds where the most dangerous disease in the world was, a daycare center for children. <laughs> they got a daycare center. I stood right out there in the front yard uh, where, where this most dangerous disease in the world existed. And I haven't had any repercussions, and hopefully those kids haven't either. But Jesus talked about pestilences, which means disease epidemics, that are going to come. I won't, I won't bore you with all the, the things about you know HIV and all the other things that are going around. But it seems like they keep coming with new diseases. Years and years ago, they used to say that Jesus had 39 stripes on his body um, because they thought that's how many nations there were. I believe it's 30. Is it 39? No, 39 diseases. I get that confused. So they had 39 stripes on him. That's ridiculous. They keep coming up with new diseases all the time. So if all he had was 39 stripes for each disease, he didn't get the rest of them. They keep coming up. But another thing, too, the Jews used a 39-stripe rule, but they didn't. They weren't the ones who laid the stripes on it. It was the Romans. The Romans didn't count. Romans just beat a man until he was almost dead. So we don't know how many stripes Jesus actually did take. Well, then it mentions here earthquakes in verse 7. Seismologists record, I got this off the Internet just last night, Seismologists record 12,000 separate measurable earthquakes each day. Isn't that interesting? I've got a, a book here I'd like to quote from. <clears throat> it's, um, You, you get some pretty good books back there on that table when we have the free stuff back there. That's where I found this. It's Dr. Rollo moved the free stuff to Hickory. Oh, did he? So the free stuff is in Hickory now. Earth's Final Dawn by Clinton Tabor. And uh, understanding this age of view of the coming new age, I don't think he means the new age, meaning the occult age of uh, new agers, but he's talking about the you know when Christ sets up his kingdom. I want to read to you some statistics that are in this book, and this book came out in 2011. So it's, it's a few years old, but listen to this. Jesus said there'll be earthquakes. The conditions that have been common in all previous generations have occurred in this generation in a much more extreme, radical, and universal manner. Consider the number of earthquakes and the magnitude of them. From 1900 to 1910, there were three earthquakes somewhere in the world that measured 6.0 or more on the Richter scale. Now, the Richter scale, I won't go into detail, but they have the little seismograph, and when there's a quake, it registers. Well, six is a major earthquake, and there were three in 1900 1910. 
that were that were 6.0 or bigger. In 19 from 1930 to 1940, there were five such earthquakes that measured 6.0 or greater. From 1950 to 1960, there were nine. So you can see it increasing. From 1960 to 1970, there were 13. Do you see it increasing? Between 1970 and 1980, there were 46. It went from 13 to 46 in 10 years. Between 1980 and 1990, there were 53. And listen to this. Between 1990 and the year 2000, these are earthquakes that are over 6.0 on the Richter scale. Wow. There were, there were, from 1980 to 1990, there were 53 such earthquakes. But from 1990 to 2000, there were 1,661 earthquakes. Huge earthquakes. Seismic developments are getting more frequent and more serious every year. It's not unusual to hear of an earthquake at a 7.0 or greater on the Richter scale with much loss of life and material destruction. The author here says, as I am writing this section, the news media are reporting a massive earthquake in Japan measuring 8.9 on the Richter scale and producing a destructive tsunami stretching across the Pacific Ocean. According to reports, this quake is one of the most severe ever recorded in human history. And this was written a few years ago. It is interesting, isn't it? That these things are happening, yet we still have people that are scoffing, as Peter said, mocking, saying, you know, where's the promise of his coming? I met a scientist one time who was a Roman Catholic, and he, uh, he wrote a book where he said, I don't think Jesus will ever come back. He said, the church has been waiting for 2,000 years. He hasn't come back yet. He said, I just don't think he's ever going to come back. Well, let me read to you from, i got a few more things here. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn, although it's a very familiar scripture, to Daniel 12. And I'm going to read something to you from Daniel 12. Now, this is a very familiar scripture to all of us, or should be. He's talking about the last days. And uh, he describes something that we can all identify with. In Matthew 12, verse 4. Daniel. Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, did I say Matthew? Forgive me. Uh, Daniel 12, and verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words... And seal the book even to the time of the end. Now, what will conditions be like in the time of the end? Many shall run to and fro. I don't have the statistics I gave several years ago about how that, that you, know, you know, go back over 100 years ago, they, they drove around horse and buggy. My grandfather dated my grandmother in a horse and buggy. He would drive the buggy all the way down here to Derrida from Kannapolis and date her on a Saturday night and then... And then uh, Drive the buggy all the way back home. Well, it wasn't a horse, it was a mule. He had a mule and buggy. But that mule knew where the barn was, and he'd just go sleep in the buggy and let the mule take him home. And he'd wake up in the barn. The mule knew, knew where home was. And he would date my grandmother for quite a while like that till finally they got married. But, rem but you know, that's just my grandparents were dating in a horse and buggy. My grandmother had some interesting stories to tell about days like that. One time she was riding on the back of the buggy. Grandpa was driving the, the buggy, and all of a sudden she, he hit a bump. She bounced off and hit the ground. <laughs> so she had some interesting stories to tell. But, but then from the horse and buggy, in my grandfather's day, he saw uh, the introduction of uh, air travel in 1903 when the Wright brothers down here at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, started flying the first motorized aircraft. And he lived to see man go to the moon. In 1969, in July of 1969, what an amazing generation he lived in. From the horse and buggy days to, now, now he was born in the 1880s, and so he got to see, you know, cars come. And, and, of course, in those days, a horseless carriage was an amazing thing to see. So travel, though, was pretty slow. But just from his generation to our day to day, look how people could travel. You can go from here to Los Angeles in a few hours in an aircraft and a big jet airplane. And yet it took them back in, back in that day. When my grandfather was born, you'd have had to got in a buggy or they didn't have cars then. It would have taken you a long time to have gotten to California. So 
Men will run to and fro. They're going to run to and fro. I'm going to read you an interesting statistic here. Um, let, me, let me go here first to this book. I've got so much up here. I need a great big lectern like they have in these big churches where they've got a lot of room to put stuff. <clears throat> Well, I think this is what I need to read you here. Now, people spend a lot of money on travel. Just Americans. We're not talking about Europeans now, but just in America. Direct spending. Now, I got this off the Internet yesterday afternoon, late yesterday afternoon. Direct spending by resident and international travelers in the United States alone for this year. In other words, people who are traveling from one state to another or people who are traveling outside from the United States it averaged $2.7 billion, that's the cost of the travel, per day. Are we running to and fro? That's $113.1 million an hour that people are spending on running to and fro. $1.9 million a minute, and it cost Americans $31,400 per second to do all this traveling. This is from a, a site I found on, on United States travel. And that's just for the United States. People will run to and fro, Daniel said. Interesting, isn't it? So are we living in the last days? Is it possible that we might be? Now, Jesus also said in Matthew 24, 14, because they asked him what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. So the last sign is the gospel will go to all the world. Now through satellite television, you can even beam the gospel into communist nations. Internet. Internet and everything. So the gospel's out there now. This very month, Billy Graham turned 99 years old, and he has preached the gospel around the world. Well, let me ask a question about that. Okay, ask a question. Going back to North Korea, their internet and their television is all state monitored. Mm -hmm. They don't get anything the government won't let them have unless it's something underground. Yeah. And China's the same way. I, have, I know people, well, I should, probably shouldn't say this on the internet, but... Um, don't, don't even mention names. No, but I know there are people in that have gone to China under the guise of a different mm -hmm. vocation mm -hmm. to preach the gospel. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I'm likely going to teach English. Mm -hmm. I was offered that same opportunity to go over there and teach English. And while you're there, you share the gospel with your students. But North Korea especially, <clears throat> it's all controlled by the government. <clears throat> And the government doesn't want their people getting the gospel, so there's probably still pockets like North Korea where people can't get it. You might be surprised uh, about how large the underground church may be because, you know, the world's largest church is just over across the border in South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea. So it's very possible they have an underground church. But, of course, we don't have statistics for that underground church. Okay. Now, I don't know how many years ago it was. You mentioned China. 20, 30 years ago, they said there was an underground church in, you know, China, communist China, where they put you in the psychiatrist's office if you say you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You're crazy because nobody can rise from the dead. So they would take a Christian and, and make him uh, subject him to psychiatric treatment because they thought you were nuts. And at that time, I heard that, that there were 40 million Chinese Christians in China in, in the underground church. I thought, 40 million? Well, I just heard... I got it out of this book. <laughs> Listen to what this says. I want to read it too. For 60 years, Billy Graham took the gospel around the world, preaching to more people in a live audience format than anyone in history. Records show that he has preached in 185 countries and to more than uh, 210 million people. At uh, 86 years of age, and this was written in 2011, and in poor health, he concluded what was thought to be his last evangelistic crusade in the city of New York where 90,000 people jammed the stadium on a Sunday afternoon in June of 2005 in sweltering heat to hear this man. I don't think it is coincidental that this man uh, finished his anointed preaching career at this point in time. I have an eerie feeling it may be one more sign that the end is very near. Uh, that may not be the book where I found this. I, I put all this together uh, yesterday or last evening, but uh, what I have read, maybe it wasn't here, or maybe I don't have the right page, 
But what I've read is is that the underground church now is like like well over 200 million, they think, in China. So it's growing despite the persecution. So people are getting the gospel. In fact, through satellite television, they're, they're picking up stuff. Uh, there were some television programs in, I think it's, was it Mongolia or somewhere, where they could actually have some television stations, and they were beaming their signal, and it's right above uh, China, just north of the border, and they were beaming their signal right into China to preach the gospel to them. So the gospel is getting out there. Now, also, the Bible says knowledge would be increased. We just read that, Daniel 12, 4. Knowledge says they shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Now, here's another statistic I want to share with you. This generation has seen an explosive increase in knowledge that is unparalleled in human history. Some say that 90% of all the engineers who have ever lived, 90% of all the engineers who have ever lived are alive today. It is estimated that 98% of everything that we know today has been learned in this generation or since the mid-60s. The rate of increase, now I want you to listen to this. The rate of increase in knowledge. Daniel 12, 4 says, and at the time of the end, knowledge will be increased. The increase in knowledge, listen to this. It is, to knowledge is estimated to have doubled between the time of Christ and the year 1900. From the time of Christ until my grandfather was, you know, running around and playing, probably, you know, flirting with the girls uh, in the year 1900. He was, he was almost a teenager at that time. From Christ until my grandfather was a young man, young boy, knowledge doubled. But from that year, from 1900 to 1950, knowledge doubled again. After that, knowledge doubled in seven-year intervals until about 1990 when it was thought to double every two to three years. Knowledge, the world's knowledge is doubling. Today, I am told that knowledge doubles every 18 to 24 months. If you were to assign an arbitrary value of 10 to the knowledge in A.D. 1, when Jesus was alive, it would register a value of more than 200,000 today, most of which will have been gained in the last few decades. It's amazing. Dr. Keith? Yes. At, at this point in time, I really don't think they can determine how fast the knowledge because our computers are always updated. Yeah. And, and it's, our it's, computers and are being updated. Time, we had to update it. Mm -hmm. Now, it updates itself. Mm -hmm. And so knowledge is increasing. I mean, I just, it's just amazing how it has increased. And the scary thing is, you know, I mean, you can't keep up with it. You can't. I'm still trying to remember what the difference is between an iPod and iPad. I mean, I can't keep up with all this technology. Well, look at technology. this. We're live. We're, we're preaching the gospel live across several countries. So, right yeah, now. something like, I think something like 75 pe uh, countries, people in 75 countries have, have watched us. Wow. So it's amazing the era in which we live. Yes, sir. Well, the pastor's Bible says that men be wiser and weaker. Wiser and weaker, yeah. 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 And you see, ISIS is taking over again. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Now everybody knows what the Muslim religion is. You go back 30 years ago. What, what religion has some, you know, some way on the other side of the world nowadays? Uh, it's right here in our backyard. Since 9-11, that's when it really got, became aware. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is going to go to all the world, but also the wrath of God is going to be poured out in the last days. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, and the Greek means hold down or suppress, the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Uh, I don't know if I've shown you guys or not, but I've got a video of, of, a, of a TV show that was just on recently called Ancient Aliens, where they acknowledge that the moon and the earth, the way it's designed, the earth is in the moon, the, 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 the size of the earth and the moon, they say that couldn't be coincidence. The earth is tilted at exactly 23 and a half degrees. The moon is the exact right distance from the earth. They say that couldn't happen by coincidence. And then they said that the moon, uh, I can't give you the numbers right now, but the moon is... is is the exact right distance from the earth so that when there's a, a, a solar eclipse, it totally eclipses the sun. The moon is the same size as the sun in the sky. How did all that happen by coincidence? And they, these 
people on this TV show. It is impossible. It couldn't be coincidence. And I'm thinking to myself, praise the Lord. Now they figured it out. God did it. They said, no, little green men, aliens, built the moon. You showed it, you showed it to the secular class, I think. I showed it to the secular class. I mean, aliens did it. They're looking at God right in the face, and they think aliens did it. That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him, because you can't see God, but looking at the creation of the world. And the word world there is the same word where we get the, the English word cosmos. Looking at the cosmos, looking at the stars, are clearly seen. You can see there is a God. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power. And Godhead so that they're without excuse. Verse 22, they profess themselves to be wise and they become fools. Little green men made the moon. Did you know that? They, they, they know it couldn't be an, an accident. It couldn't be coincidence. So they assume somebody had to have made it, but they don't see God. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Think about our modern age who changed the truth of God into a lie. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Now, a man having affection toward a woman, that's natural. Now, we should have affection for everybody, but you know I'm talking about intimate affection. Yeah. Vile affections, guess what he's talking about? For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And it, you know, uh, children may not understand what he's talking about, but adults can read that very easily determine what he's talking about. And likewise, also the, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and that's an understatement, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet or fitting. And now today we've got, you know, politicians who say, well, it's not wrong. Men can marry other men. That is so repugnant, it makes you want to vomit. We've got pastors saying it's okay and yeah. performing ceremonies. Oh, I know. I grew up in the Methodist church, and I've read about Methodist pastors performing homosexual marriages for people. They have no shame. Verse 28 tells us why they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, in other words, they're gossipers. Back by whispers. Look at all the, 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 the junk that you see now coming out, starting with uh, Weinstein and some of these others. Somebody new every day. Every day. Uh, somebody, you know what? I see nothing but hypocrisy in that. That is utter hypocrisy. And, and this one fellow who believes in keeping the Ten Commandments on his courtroom wall, he's now running for public office, and so... So these ladies alleged that, that he was uh, bad 40 years ago. Why are they waiting till an election before they bring it out? It's politically motivated. Even if it's true, it's politically motivated. And in the last 40 years, that man could have repented and turned his life over to Christ and now living a godly life. But they're going to bring up junk like that. That's utter hypocrisy. When God gets ready to judge people like that, he's going to say, you didn't have mercy. I'm going to show you mercy. It's in the Bible. To him that shows mercy, God will show mercy. Yes? How can we be sure that this women are telling the truth? And that's just it. It's, it's, and, and, and Judge Roy Moore has totally denied it. It's their word against his. And he's totally denied it. But yet the news media will take the side of the women. Now, some of it probably is true when it comes to Weinstein. And, of course, that, what was that? Bill Franklin? Is that his name? Bill Franken? The Al Franken. Al Franken. Franklin. Franken. Franken. He, he admitted, you know, he's done these things. They got photographic proof of it. But the, but the fact is, you know, if I know that you've committed sin, I'm not going to point your finger and blow it up all over the Internet and tell everybody that you did it because that's between you and God. I think it's just utter hypocrisy to point out the sins of other people. Jesus said, he that is without sin, you throw the first stone. I just, I just... I, I do know there is such a thing as genuine sexual harassment. And let me tell you what the definition of that initially was. It's when a woman couldn't keep her job unless she slept with the boss. Now, that was genuine sexual harassment where he's harassing her day after day after day, stalking her and this kind of thing. But today it has come from that, which is genuine harassment, to, and I worked for an HR company down here in Charlotte some years ago. It has come now to the point if you just, 
in your office, you call a, a lady honey or something, she gets you for sexual that's, harassment. That's what Harvey Weinstein was doing with all those actresses. He was telling them they weren't going to get a job if they didn't. And that's that's genuine harassment. I, I don't, or harassment, however you want to say it. I don't deny there is genuine. But but we were also told in an HR office, if you so much as wink at somebody, if you're a boss and, and you wink at somebody, that's sexual harassment. It's got to the point now where you don't even want to say good morning. It's ridiculous. And it, it irritates me at the, the hypocrisy of these people. <clears throat> Backbiters, verse 30, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, not honoring parents, without understanding, boy, that describes our generation, covenant breakers, without natural affection, but turned over to vile affections. Implacable, unmerciful. Who know the judgment of God that if you do these things, you're worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in the rest of the people who are doing them. This is this is horrible. This is what we're going to see in the last days, and we're seeing it happen now. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians one thirteen that they preach the gospel of your salvation. The gospel brings people to salvation, so that we can be saved. And these, these things here, the, the unsaved world, they're doing these things, the news media, I mean the TV shows, they're promoting, uh, I don't even want to talk about it, the kids here, but some of them are actually promoting sex outside of marriage, they're promote, and they're even promoting homosexuality. It, and, and, and Hollywood, Hollywood is a sewer. It is, it's terrible. But in Paul's day, sodomy was prevalent. I remember during the Democratic Convention, Hillary had a man who was married to another man. And he came up on the platform and he, he, he said, uh, I, I'm, I'm gay and, and I'm married. He looked over at his man. He said, and here's my husband. Hi, honey. I about vomited right off the TV set. A man calling another man honey. I Really, I about got sick. That would have never happened 50 years ago in this Christian country of ours, the United States of America. And I'm not talking politics. I'm talking morality, decency, Christianity, and last day's eschatology. It's ridiculous. Now, by the way, do I hate homosexuals? Let me clarify this. No, I don't hate them. I don't hate child molesters. Don't like them. <laughs> but I don't hate them. I don't hate adulterers. I want to see them get saved. But what I, when I get on radio and attack this kind of thing, what I do is I attack the churches that are tolerant towards sin and not telling them, hey, you can't keep doing that and end up in God's kingdom. Because right. they've been told it's just an alternate lifestyle. Oh, it's alternate. But it's alternate as hell is from heaven. It's wrong to do these things. And in Christian love, we have to tell people, if you do these things, you will not be in the kingdom of God. If you do these things, you will not make it in God's kingdom. That's what we have to tell people. That's showing love. You're not a homophobe to say, that's disgusting. It is. Listen, if you don't think that kind of behavior is disgusting, what, what would it take to get you to think something's disgusting? Now, I don't hate any person who may have a genetic propensity. I'm not a medical expert, so I don't know. They say there might be a gene that causes this person to have a certain inclination. By all means, we should have mercy toward every person who is in sin. And I believe that Christian love demands that we show mercy. But, you know, if a person came, let's say, to this church, and they came to me and they said, listen, I want to talk to you privately. I've got this problem. Will you pray with me? Of course I'll pray with him. And he can, he can sit right in the front in the best seat in the house. I don't care. But if a person walks in here carrying a, a sign and he says, I'm gay and I'm proud of it, there's the door. You found it to come in, better find it to get out. Because I don't want somebody like that corrupting our children. That's not going to happen here. Now, if he wants to leave a sign outside and come in here and hear the gospel, that's fine. But the churches don't have enough backbone now to come out and call us sin a sin. They're afraid to. We've got, we've got preachers now on television who are, seeing, who are saying, you're a champion. You're wonderful. You're victorious. You're great. Bring out the champion in you. You don't, don't, don't tell you you're a sinner. Yes, sir. It is disgusting because the Bible says it's vile affections. Vile affections. So, so the Bible clearly defines how it feels about it. Yeah. And, and, and that gene, the Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. 
but you can drive it out with the rod of yeah. correction. Yeah. And so certain things that people have, uh, they, will, they, they were born in the foolishness. Yeah. But that's why the Bible said train up a child in the way that he should go. Yeah. So, so when a parent see that type of behavior, they have to deal with it. You deal with it, you address it, and you educate the, the, the child, and you drive that foolishness out of it. With the rod. You do it with a rod. Talk to him first, but then <laughs> use the rod. But yeah, the Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your child because you've got to discipline children. And some people, some stupid parents are saying, well, you know, I know he's only two years old, but, you know, it's his choice. Come on. That's ridiculous. Well, he's got to make his own decisions. That dumb parent may never see the kingdom of God either if they don't get straightened out. Yes, sir. It's an abomination. Yeah, it's not just a, a, a sin to miss the mark. It's 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 vile. This world has gotten so vile. There's a show on the on TLC channel mm -hmm. about a little boy that has decided that he was a girl, oh. and his parents have let him live as a girl since he was a small child. And the last commercial I saw for it were. They were mm. discussing with the doctor him having uh, surgery. Surgery to, to turn into a girl. How old is the boy? He's a teenager now, but he's been living that way. That his parents have allowed him to live that way since he was little. Yeah. And the rod of uh, correction would have driven that far from a long time ago. <laughs> and I know people think, well, that's hate speech. It's not hate speech. If you, The Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. You've got to discipline them. Yeah. So that's a loving act to show somebody this is what God's will for their life is mm -hmm. and, and steer them toward correction. you got to steer them in the right way because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. He doesn't know right from wrong and that's the whole point of God giving children parents so the parents can teach them right from wrong. And Dr. King, even, mm -hmm. even Christ said that he didn't come to do his own will. Yeah. He came to do the will of the Father. Do the will of, yeah, of the and Father. So as, as God's will, not yeah. let them have their own choice. Absolutely. God would never want what's mm -hmm. bad for us. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, just like Pedro wouldn't want what's bad for his children, yeah. God always wants his best for us, and his word shows us what yeah. his best for us is, and, yeah. and it's loving to steer mm -hmm. people in that direction. Yeah, my dad didn't ask me when I was seven years old, do you want to go to church? He said, right. get dressed. Because as a seven-year-old, you know what I wanted to do on the same morning? Go ride my bicycle. Go play with the dog. Watch television. If I'd had the choice, I'd have stayed home. I didn't get that choice. So they brought me up in the way I should go. And then when I get older, now it's up to me. Right. And where am I? I'm in church because I was raised correctly. Now, I may have changed churches since then. But the point is, I, I was raised hearing the gospel. When I was outside playing and Billy Graham would come on, my mother would make me come in from playing. Now, you sit there in front of the TV and you listen. And so I got taught and got instructed early on, and it, and it took. Researcher George Barna, he is the most quoted Christian in America, according to one survey, and it wasn't his own survey, reported in 2002 that 83% of teens in America believe that moral truth depends on the circumstances. This is called situation ethics. He went on to say that only 9% of teens raised in the church believe in moral absolutes. Only 9% believe there is really a right and a wrong because they've been so educated by the, the schools they go to. George Barna, I had a chance to meet him a few years ago, and I said, you know, you've got to be one of the most quoted researchers in the world. It's like Gallup polls, you know. A Gallup, everybody knows the Gallup poll. Well, George Barna is the Gallup poll of Christian uh, uh, things and situations. He does Christian surveying. He said, some survey said he was the most quoted Christian in, in, in the world. <laughs> some survey that, that, was, that he was not a part of. So the teens don't believe there's any such thing as, as absolute morality. A radical moral shift has taken place in our culture in one generation, says the author of this book, creating a crisis of hope. We don't know the difference between right and wrong. The pervasiveness of evil has rotted away the moral foundations of our culture. This is a generation that has lost its way in respect to moral values. When I was in the first grade, we prayed. 
We, we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Now they've ruled it's unconstitutional to have children to say the Pledge of Allegiance. It's unconstitutional. How ridiculous. We prayed. We, we even memorized scripture and had to come back the following week and get up and, and, and quote scripture. I was in the first grade in a public school down here at Weinkauf. Weinkauf Public School. The prevailing attitude is today there is no such thing as sin. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Terrorism. ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda. I don't know all these different terrorist groups. But we're in perilous times. This author makes a, another statement about that. He says the, uh, the global stockpile of nuclear bomb-making material is now large enough to make 120,000 suitcase bombs, an atomic bomb that you can put in a suitcase, one, of, one, just one of which could reduce an entire city to ashes. World leaders know that terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda have been actively working to secure bomb-making material. And then we just recently heard in the last month, about last month or two, uh, when Hillary was Secretary of State, that she sold uranium to the Russians, and that's what you make atomic bombs from. And America doesn't have enough uranium as it is, and we're selling what we do have to the Russians. That's the, that's the actual Russian scandal now that's brought out by the New York Times, believe it or not. Well, in verse 2 it says, Men will be lovers of their own selves. Verse 3, without natural affection. They're going to be traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And yet in the last days they'll have a form of godliness, churches on every corner as it were, but they'll deny the power thereof from such turn away. Don't have anything to do with that. I have a magazine. I just got the mail yesterday. Just got this magazine, the mail yesterday. It's a Christian magazine that's got some interesting uh, statistics in it also. Let me read just a little bit of the time we have left. The title of this article, here's, a, here's an actual photograph of cars off the streets, telephone poles down from the storms. The title is Floods, Fires, Other Disasters, Stress State Budgets. The combined tab from hurricanes, Harvey and Irma, is expected to hit $200 billion or more. Now that's when America is already in debt over $20 trillion. We can't afford this. You might say, well, where is God? where we left him. He's not in the schools, that's for sure. He's in the storm. He's in, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he may be in the storm. He's trying to get our attention. This is what's happening. On page 32 of this magazine, let me read you another statement here. Now, I told you that, that America and Britain had 6% of the world's wealth, but now because of our sin, that's diminishing. Here is some statistics. I just got this in the mail. This was the November, December issue of this particular magazine. According to, uh, <clears throat> this is in the United Kingdom, England and uh, Scotland, Wales. They have an organization called the Charity Crisis Center. It reported that among British households in 2016, just this past year, 19,300 people were living in unsuitable temporary accommodations. 37,200 were living in hostels. In addition, 26,000 households in England were living in other circumstances, Britain, I should say. 8,900 were sleeping in tents, cars, or on public transport. 12,100 were squatting on a property they did not own. You know, how would you like to get morning six people out there on your front lawn sleeping in sleeping bags? 5,000 in women's refugees or winter night shelters. What's happening in England? Well, lack of jobs is a horrible homeless situation. From The Guardian, uh, The Guardian wrote, more than a million households living in private rented accommodation are at risk of becoming homeless by 2020. More than a million. So it's, God is taking away our blessings. Yes, sir. Pastor, you can go down on Tryon Street after 10 o'clock at night, and all those benches on both sides of the street is full of people with blankets. Mm. Really? I haven't been down Tryon Street like yeah, that. No. Man, people sleep on the street. Go down there at 12 o'clock today, and they're all out in the field across from the uh, wow. car wash over there eating. Mm -hmm. Sit at tables and feed them over there. Go to the Atlanta Clippers. That's right. Man. Paul, 
same way. I've never noticed it around here. When I lived in the Washington, D.C. area, I did notice it up there. People sleeping out on the streets. There used to be one guy that would sleep on one of the benches down in the park in town, but I don't ever, I don't know what happened to him. Let me go back to Daniel 12 for just a moment. In verse 1, it says, talking about the last days, and at that time, at the time of the end, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, to, even to that same time. Now, the, the tribulation period and the day of the Lord together is about an eight-year period. Well, the whole tribulation is not seven years. But, from, well, actually, if you count just the tribulation itself, which is three and a half years, you're looking at about a four-and-a-half-year period total. But if you start from the beginning of the, when they build the temple, you count about another eight years later, Christ will have returned. Because the day of the Lord, it's integrated, just integrated, 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 Intimated, let's use that word. It's intimated, it's hinted at that the day of the Lord may be a full year. We know one of the trumpets, there's seven trumpets, and one of them alone is five months long. So the day of the Lord may be at least a year or even longer. But that's but this this is a time of trouble such as was not from the beginning of the world, and that is just ahead of us now. Just a few more scriptures. In the book of Joel, I'm not going to read all the scriptures I've written down, but in Joel chapter 2, verse 1, it says, The day of the, of the Lord comes, it is nigh at hand. It's a day of darkness, gloominess, clouds, and thick darkness. There has never, ever been the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to many generations. So that so in, in this period of time when Israel fell, it was a, a day of the Lord, meaning a time of judgment. But it was a type of the day of the Lord where there will never be anything like it ever again. It's going to be the worst, the worst time. It's even going to be worse than this. Now, the worst time history has ever known in recorded history is World War II. Fifty million died. Much worse than World War I, where I think it was 18 million. Is that right? Do you remember? I think it was 18 million that died in World War I. So World War II is much worse. But World War III, you're looking at billions. It's going to be the worst time in all of history. And that's the tribulation. Now, in, in Joel chapter... Uh, Three and verse 1, Behold, in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity, that means the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, he's going to bring them back into the land. And right now we see the Jews returning to that part of the land. Now, he didn't mention Israel here, he just mentioned Judah. So the Jews are going over there first right now. I will also gather all nations, will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and notice this, and parted my land. The Jewish translation says they have divided my land. What is it that the United Nations wants to do? They want to divide and give part of it to the Palestinians and take it away from the, from the Jewish people. So that is an indication we're in the last days. They're wanting to, to divide the land of Israel and give some of it to the Palestinians. It's a dangerous time in which we live. Amos 5, 13. The next book over, and I'm not going to have time to read all these scriptures that I've written down here, but in Amos chapter 5 and verse 13. Uh, there, that one in, yeah. uh, Jehoshaphat, what is that? We believe that's the Battle of Armageddon. Um, what, what is the title? Uh, all the scriptures? Yeah. Uh, Joel, that, was Joel 3, 1. Joel 3, 1, yeah. Wait, was that Joel 3, 1? Well, Joel 3, something yeah. like that. Amos 5, 13, therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time. So I've got to learn to keep my mouth shut when it really gets bad. <laughs> Watch what I say on the radio. For it's an evil time. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. Now I want to look, pay close attention to verse 15. Hate the evil. I hate all the garbage I see that's happening in, in our world today. Love the good. Establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, talking about uh, Israel that, at that time. But in the last days, whether you're an Israelite or not, I want God to be gracious to us, don't you? Yes. Verse uh, 18, Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you if you're in sin? Verse 20, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very darkness and no light in it? That's what we're looking at. Chapter uh, 8 and verse Let's see here. Um, 
verse 11, the days come, I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread. This is Rome, uh, Amos 8, verse 11. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, Jesus said the gospel will be preached in all the world. That's not a famine. But then the end comes. When the end comes, the end of the preaching of the gospel, and, the, and then the very next verse, verse 15 of Matthew 24, says, when you see that abomination of desolation standing in the temple. That's when the famine of the hearing of the, of the word begins. You won't hear the word of the Lord because the Antichrist is going to be running things. And even here in America, it will probably be against the law to preach the gospel. That's why we need to reach as many people as we can before that time comes. Can we repent? Is America going to be saved? In Jonah chapter 3, let me read to you what it says in Jonah 3 verse 8. The king there said, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let every, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. I wonder if America could do that. Who can tell, verse 9, if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? That's the prayer America needs to be praying. It worked for Nineveh and it can work for us. Well, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to summarize it here. Let me go to Psalm 10 and verse 4. There's uh, several scriptures here I don't have time to give you. But because uh, sometimes I just write, and I see so much, I'll write this down, write that down. Next thing I got, I got it'll take me two weeks to cover it all. But I'm not, this is, I'm going to do it all in one week here. Psalm 10 and verse 4 says this. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Now listen to this. God is not in all his thoughts. This is Psalm 10, verse 4. That implies that if you're a Christian, God needs to be in all your thoughts. Luke 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Just keep pray, be in prayer. You're driving down the road, you're praying, you go to work, you come home from work. When you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, Stay in constant communion with God. God should be in all your thoughts. It's not wrong to watch a ball game. But during the commercials, think about God. God needs to be just in our thoughts. You know, you, you guys who have been married, you know what it is. If you're in love, you think about that girl. When you get up in the morning, you think about her at lunchtime. You think about her when you go to bed at night. That's how I'll be with God. We think about God all the time. He's in all of our thoughts. God should be in all of our thoughts. And then finally, I won't ask you to turn to these scriptures, but Luke 21, 36 talks about, they ask him about the last days. This is also the Olivet Prophecy according uh, to Luke. And Jesus said, watch and pray always. Pray always. The watch means stay alert. Watch and pray always. That you, you whose names are in the book of life, because their names are in the book of life, he said, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And then in Revelation 3, to the Philadelphians, verses 8 through 10, he says there were two things the Philadelphian Christians did in the last days. Jesus said they've kept his word, that had better be us, and have not denied his name. That doesn't just mean not denying the, the word, Jesus. But to deny his name means to deny his authority. If we're not willing to keep his Ten Commandments and his statutes and the judgments of God, we're denying his authority in our life. We're technically denying his lordship. But the Philadelphians are keeping his word. They're not denying his name. And here's what Jesus said in verse 10. Because of this, I will keep you out of this hour of trial. This is going to come upon all nations, the trial of them that dwell upon the earth. Are you a Philadelphian Christian? I don't know whether they're going to build the temple in our lifetime or not, but I do know one thing. About two, three years ago, now they finished the last altar there in Jerusalem, and now they're ready to build the temple. They've got a school to train Levites to offer sacrifices. They are serious about rebuilding the temple. And when they rebuild it, and when they offer that first sacrifice, they may do that before the temple is even finished. Start counting down. That's when the clock starts. Like a football game, they stop the clock. Well, well the clock of prophecy seems to be stopped. But once they offer that first sacrifice in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, the clock starts back. And we've got less than 10 years before Jesus Christ is standing on this earth. Maybe eight years. But it's even less time than that before the Great Tribulation hits the world. And if you're not a Philadelphian, you may go right through it. So are you a part of God's end time work? Are you supporting it with your prayers? 
Are you being a part of it? Or do you, do you really want to be a part of what God is doing in the last days? Don't support those who say, oh, the law's all done away. Because to have a great reward in God's kingdom, you have to do two things. Keep the law and teach others. And that's what we're trying to do. Any questions? Yes, sir. Talking about earthquakes earlier, they've had two earthquakes in North Carolina in the last seven days. Really? Two earthquakes here? In the last week? In the last seven days, I've had two earthquakes. You know, I've never felt an earthquake. Oh, I have. Here. Going to California. There was I, one in Charlotte. I went to California. We felt in Charlotte. Because yeah. I was sitting at my desk yeah. in Charlotte and felt it. Earthquakes in diverse places. But I've never felt an earthquake. I went to California hoping I would. I want to see what it feel like. And I was out there for the whole year and never had an earthquake. Yes, sir. I've been in four major earthquakes in California. Four major earthquakes in California. Yeah, and I missed it all when I went out there. It just rained when I was out there. Yeah, we couldn't even walk across the white line without stumbling. <laughs> you want to touch Philadelphia. Yeah, that may be what it is. <laughs> well, good to see everybody here. Glad to have all of you. For those of you who came in late, good to have you here and uh, get a chance to talk to you after the service here. And we are dismissed. want to thank all those watching over the Internet. Share this with your friends and family.